Um, so uh, the story, uh, we're going to be looking at peripherals today. And the story is that laptops are getting smaller, uh, more devices are going external, so we have things like chargers and docking stations and dongles, which you borrow from other people. And uh, these are increasingly high-performance peripherals. So let's think about the security aspect of this. So, so one of the things to notice, firstly from a user interface point of view, is that uh, with USB-C we have all of these protocols that are converged into one connector. So we have USB, video, power, audio, and so on. Uh, and the cable you plug in selects which protocol you want to use. So today we're going to talk about Thunderbolt uh, and PCI Express. So Thunderbolt is PCI Express over the USB Type-C connector. So we're going to think about the security implications of that. So um, USB is a message-based protocol, which means that people can craft bad messages. So buffer overrun, usual networking kind of attacks. PCI Express is a shared memory protocol, which means you can do direct memory access uh, from a device without going via the CPU. And this happens when performance is more critical. Uh, and that exposes uh, potentially a lot of or all of system memory to peripheral devices. Um, so the threat model for a PCI Express might be that you have an existing chip or an existing plug-in card in your server uh, that has a bad firmware update uh, or is compromised over the network. Um, but also, more recently, we have Thunderbolt. So Thunderbolt is PCI Express and DisplayPort over the USB-C connector. And now we can hot plug devices that can do DMA uh, and can access your system memory uh, that you might find lying around. So an airport charging station, for example. And those devices can do everything that PCIe can do and more with more scope for user confusion. So defenses. So um, the primary defense is called the IOMMU, the Input Output Memory Management Unit, which is a memory management unit for device memory access. So as this uh, program on the CPU accesses memory, it goes through the MMU. As a device accesses memory, uh, through interconnect like PCI Express, uh, the IMU is protects and virtualize that memory access. Uh, and similarly for a Thunderbolt device, it's just the same way. So an IMU is a page-based uh, protection mechanism that maps 4K or larger pages into a virtual address space. And uh, it, is a, it has a cache to make it faster, so the IOTLB is a cache similar to the TLB in an MMU system. And there's a bunch of implementations with minor di uh, differences between them. So uh, how it, what do systems do to use the IMMU to protect from the IO devices? Well, turns out Windows 7, Windows 8, uh, Windows 10, and Windows, uh, Windows 10 Home and Pro didn't use the IMMU at all to protect from devices. So all the memory was exposed to peripheral devices. Mac OS, uh, since 2012, enables the IMMU for protection. So that's a good start. Uh, Linux and FreeBSD support using the IMMU, but it's not turned on by default. And often, uh, the IMMU is not turned on by default in BIOS. So this is not good. But we're going to assume that the vendor has at least turned the feature on and is at least trying slightly. So what's the attack surface? So previous work has said that uh, when the IMMU is enabled, all the attacks are foiled. Nice green box. But those are simple memory probing attacks. So you just go and read what memory you can. You don't interact with the device driver or the kernel. But actually, the attack surface is much more nuanced. Um, so a device interacts with the device driver, with the kernel. Um, the OS starts to trust it. It opens up memory uh, windows to allow the device to access. So what can we actually do as a real device? We didn't have a real device that we could play with, so we built a fake network card. So we took QMU's uh, device model of an Intel uh, network card. And since it's software, we could add malicious behavior to this software model of a device. So we needed to add some hardware to run it in a real system. So we run it on a CPU on an FPGA. And uh, we can send and receive PCI Express packets uh, from our fake network card to the system. And we translate those PCI Express packets into the sort of memory accesses that QMU uses. So the fake network card can make real DMA transactions to and from the system. And that runs on an FPGA board in a Thunderbolt dock, possibly. And, and we've open sourced that platform. Uh, we've also designed some embodiments of that platform uh, in malicious shapes, like a malicious Thunderbolt dock. Um, we haven't released those at this time. So um, let's look at some attacks. 
So Windows 10, uh, we said Home and Pro don't use the ARMMU. Uh, Windows 10 Enterprise doesn't by default, but there is an option to enable it. So uh, Enterprise can enable a feature called virtualization-based security that runs the main operating system in a Hyper-V virtual machine. Um, and alongside, there's a mini kernel for storing things like disk encryption keys. So under VBS, um, while the disk encryption keys and the mini kernel is protected, the rest of the system is completely unprotected. So attackers can have free reign, key loggers, screen capture, uh, read, run arbitrary code, the works. So that's not good. But uh, we weren't actually um, uh, being a real device at that point. So if we're a real device, what can we do? So I'm going to explain a couple of data structures that are used in real devices and uh, how we can subvert them. So the first one is the network packet buffer structures, uh, which are the mbuff on Mac OS and FreeBSD, the skbuff on Linux, and the netbuffer list on Windows. This is a linked list of chains of packet data that we want to send, for example. So we might have data that's internal to the linked list structure. Or we might have data that's external um, and is allocated by the kernel and freed when a packet is sent. Um, and that free function, there's a free function pointer in the data structure that we're going to use in a minute. Um, that's a OS structure, so we have to convert that to a device driver. The device driver converts that to a data structure for a specific hardware. And that's a ring buffer structure. So there is a table of pointers that the NIC follows by DMA. Uh, those pointers point to pieces of packet data that, that then reads and joins together to, send, to generate a packet to send. Uh, and we're going to have some fun with that structure as well. So uh, the IMMU, um, we talk about windows, which are pieces of memory that are exposed to a device that the device can read and write. And these are based in pages. And there might be some data that we want to give to the device there. But around it, uh, there, there might be some metadata that belongs to the kernel that we don't need to expose to the device, but happens to be exposed because the pages, uh, because the, the exposure is in sizes of pages. And, and there might also be allocations for some completely different piece of the kernel that just happen to live in the same memory. Um, there is also a temporal vulnerability, so which exploits the gap between when a, a window is closed or the kernel asks for a window to be closed and the window is closed, um, the data, the, the memory could be reused for something else before it's actually blocked from the device. So let's talk about some attacks. So on MacOS, all the devices share a single page map, which means that while the network card can't read and write kernel or application memory, it can access things like uh, buffers for USB, like key, key logging, uh, can act, read the frame buffer, and so on. So, um, the uh, mbuff structure is allocated a single block uh, at boot and um, exposed to all devices, which means that all the network cards can see all of, in fact, all of the peripherals can see all of the network traffic all of the time. Um, so we can see things like traffic for other network cards, plain text for VPNs, and so on. So, okay, so that was a data exposure. So let's try and run a root shell. So um, firstly, we need to break a kernel address-based layout randomization which we can do from a symbol leaked from the USB stack. Uh, and in the mbuff, there is that free function pointer plus the parameters to the, to the free function. And all these are exposed to the device. So let's go through how this works. Uh, so we plug in a, a device over PCI Express or Thunderbolt, and uh, the um, uh, uh, OS says, what kind of device are you? And the device says, I'm a NIC. Sure, OK. So the OS now looks up in its table and works out what kind of device driver to load. And so the, the um, malicious device has picked the most buggy device driver. And um, so then when we can start sending some data, so here are some descriptor rings, data to send, and so on. Cool, OK. You believe me. Um, so we know we can send network packets, uh, start OS services, and so on. But we can also use that spatial vulnerability to see what other data we can read and write. So uh, in the case of the um, root shell attack, um, we can search IO memory looking for the kernel code pointers um, to break KSLR. So, oh, there's one in the USB space. And that's because a shared address space across devices means that uh, one uh, device can then look at the memory exposed to all of the other ones. Um, so we shouldn't be able to see that USB pointer, but it's there because of that shared uh, mapping. Um, and so KSLR is broken because some other part has leaked the secret KSLR offset. So um, if we want to attack kernel control flow, 
um, when we, uh, the uh, OS gives us a packet to send, um, we can replace that free function pointer with um, a value of our choosing, a choosing with the KSLR broken. Um, and uh, so the OS runs that uh, function pointer and uh, we also control the timing of that. So um, we uh, now control the, we can get the kernel to execute the function pointer, we can run a ROP style attack. So um, there are some variations of this. So uh, FreeBSD and Linux have a page map per device, so they don't share with the USB, um, but you can still see data that's on the same pages, um, and you can uh, run the same attack on FreeBSD uh, root shell because there's no KSLR, and on Linux, the kernel allocator is used by the driver, so um, we can see kernel jump tables uh, and uh, Unix domain socket, socket traffic and lots more. Um, so we can also do a spatio-temporal attack. So when the driver is going to send some data, it puts some data in the ring buffer uh, and increments the pointer of the TX queue. Um, the NIC uh, increments the tail pointer to say uh, it's finished with some data. So we, the NIC can hold on to that pointer, preventing it updating the pointer, and keep the IMMU windows open, and then go fish around to see what other data turns up over time. Um, and we can see uh, other traffic churn through that. So let's ch change tack a little bit. Um, on Linux, uh, we, can, we want to bypass the IMMU, and there's a handy feature called address translation services, which means that for PCI Express, uh, can carry pre-translated addresses uh, for performance reasons. So we don't have to go across sockets in a multi-socket server. And pre-translated addresses means that we can do memory reads and writes of physical, arbitrary physical addresses without the ARMMU in the way. So how does this work? So we say uh, Thunderclap, hey guys, we support ATS. Linux enables ATS on the PCI switches. And then we set a bit in our PCI packets to say this address is pre-translated it's a physical address. You don't need to go via the ARMMU. Set that bit. We've completely bypassed the ARMMU. Oops. So um, we've shown that the ARMMU attack surface is uh, more rich and complex and nuanced than was previously thought. Um, it's much more powerful than attacks such as USB. And the defenses are really not good. So this looks a little bit like the system call interface. So you have um, programs making calls of the kernel. That's been fairly well hardened and uh, audited and so on. But operating system kernels haven't really thought about malicious devices. And so there's lots of buggy device driver code running in the kernel, parsing data coming from devices. And so we can pick the, the most vulnerable device driver. Why is it this bad? Well, the thing we haven't talked about is performance. And going through the IMU is expensive, page table walks. Uh, the caches are not big enough, and uh, syn synchronous uh, uh, revocation to prevent the tem temporal vulnerability is expensive. So, um, and optimizations for that, like ATS, can be a vulnerability, which explains why the ARMMU is not enabled by default, uh, or like MacOS, only uses it to a small degree. So, don't worry too much, because some of these... Um, vulnerabilities have been mitigated. So we've been talking to vendors since 2016. Um, Apple mitigated the specific exploit we told them about uh, in uh, Mac OS 10.12.4. Uh, so the kernel pointer is now encrypted, so we can't uh, change the, um, the pointer uh, and get the kernel to execute that pointer. Um, Microsoft have recently shipped uh, what they call kernel DMA protection for Thunderbolt 3 in Windows 10 version 18.03, so that means the IMMU is now turned on on Windows, uh, only for Thunderbolt devices, and it means you need to have firmware that supports, uh, is shipped with Windows 18.03 or later. So older devices that are upgraded will only work if there is a firmware update. Um, Intel have enabled the IMMU for Thunderbolt devices in what's now going to be uh, Linux kernel uh, 5.0 when it's released, um, and they've disabled ATS. Um, but those mitigations mitigate to some degree, but our, we are assuming an active IMMU. Uh, so for Windows, for Linux, and also for Mac OS, uh, our attacks are still relevant because this is a vulnerability space rather than point attacks. Uh, so, and also a, a major laptop vendor has said they won't ship Thunderbolt in products until they understand this attack vector better. 
But we have to be eternally vigilant because DMA keeps turning up in new places for this performance reason. So there's PCI Express turning up in phones. There's the SD card spec version 7, which has PCI Express. There's even NVMe over Ethernet. So DMA over the internet, what could go wrong? Um, so to conclude, we presented the IMMU attack surface as a new and rich field for vulnerabilities. We've open sourced our research platform so uh, others can explore this field. In particular, we've been encouraging vendors um, to do more security analysis of their operating systems, of their devices. Uh, and we were helping them to do that. Um, we told you some stories about how to attack um, for OS platforms, including bypassing the IO MMU completely. Um, a, lot of these, a lot of the basic mitigations are already shipped, so if, as long as you've installed your security updates, you should be okay, but the general vulnerability space still uh, exists. And um, more major work may be required in restructuring operating systems um, to guard against these vulnerabilities. Um, we have open sourced our uh, code base, and we have some um, questions and answers on our website, thunderclap.io. Uh, thanks. Questions? Uh, Ian from Qualcomm. Uh, <coughs> great work. Uh, I have one quick question. So I, when you um, exploit that um, vulnerability, I don't see the reason why you need a uh, FP, uh, FPGA run um, CPU. Is that possible that you uh, launch the same attack with, uh, with just a um, on-the-shelf CPU processor? So like uh, yes. Um, well, the reason for using an FPGA was we wanted to explore the broad vulnerability space. So the, potentially the attacks like the ATS attack wouldn't be possible with a commercial chip. Um, there are, um, some of the attacks are possible from existing um, uh, peripheral chips, um, but often the, the ability to do DMA is restricted for some, um, some limitations from the vendor of the chip. So the FPGA meant we could just craft any arbitrary packets we wanted to. Um, a specific chip would have a specific set of limitations. Um, some previous workers used some of those chips but not been able to do the things we've been doing because of those limitations. Thank you.